Um, Sir Anand Satyanand is a former lawyer, judge and ombudsman who served as the 19th Governor General of New Zealand from 2006 to 2011. He was born and raised in Auckland and he graduated with a Bachelor of Law degree from the University of Auckland in 1970. Following admission to the bar later that year, he worked at the Crown Solicitor's Office in Auckland before becoming a partner in an Auckland law firm. He was appointed as a judge in 1982 and during this time served as a prison board chairman and on the National Parole Board. In 1995, he was appointed as parliamentary ombudsman serving two five-year terms. Sir Anand was made a Distinguished Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for Public Services in 2005. He was made a Principal Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit in 2006 and a Companion of the Queen's Service Order in 2007. And he was redesignated as a Knight Grand Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit in 2009. Now I've left out quite a lot there um, I, I could have gone on for quite some time, but I thought it'd be good for us to discover uh, in the questions more about your um, interesting career. Now, Sir Anand and his wife Susan were married in 1970, and they have three children and several grandchildren. And in case you were unaware, we are very privileged to have uh, Anand's wife Susan as the patron of Age Concern Wellington Region. And it's lovely to have... Um, her as a figurehead of our organization and promoting uh, our vision and mission. So Anand, welcome. Great again to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Stephen. My first question is, where did you grow up? We, knew, we know now you grew up in Auckland, but do you want to tell us a bit about that? And do you remember much about your childhood? Yes, I do. I had a happy childhood. Uh, my father was uh, a, a, a GP, a, a medical doctor, and my mother, a Karatani nurse, who was a medical flavour to our family life. Um, and in the course of my boyhood, we lived in two Auckland suburbs, Ponsonby, then not as flash as it is today, and Glen Innes, which uh, remains somewhat the same that it is today. Um, and it's in Glen Innes that I went to Sacred Heart College in that suburb. Um, but I had uh, uh, the a regular kind of uh, New Zealand boyhood of the 1950s with um, uh, school uh, and sports, notably uh, football and cricket. And our household was a sporting household. My doctor, my father, alongside being... Um, a GP was the doctor to the rugby league and a doctor to the cricket. So we would find ourselves regularly at the weekends at uh, Eden Park or Carlo Park. And uh, so uh, that's our boyhood um, past. I have a younger brother, six years younger than myself, who, of course, also lived uh, with us in Ponsonby and then Glen Innes. Um, did you uh, know, or when did you know kind of your career direction? Well, you know, reading out that uh, uh, progression of my career, it all looks uh, as though my career was meticulously planned. But I can tell you that the... Um, the reality was not quite like that. Um, I was uh, always uh, in the kind of upper third of uh, my classes at both primary school and secondary school. But I, I wasn't at the top. And I figured when I left school that I would... Uh, I would like to uh, to be a medical professional. So I went to uh, uh, university, and in those days you did English, chemistry, and zoology. No, you did physics, chemistry, and zoology, 
which was the sort of filter as to whether you would uh, get into medical school. Well, I found that the filter worked um, against my interests in that whilst uh, zoology and chemistry could be handled, my aptitude for mathematics and physics was, uh, was not good. And uh, at the end of 1963, after having had two goes, uh, there was no way in which I could see entry into the uh, medical school as a possibility. In those years, uh, you could switch subjects so long as you passed, and then you could resume uh, the bursary. And um, that's what I did. I had gone to Otago for the, for, the, for the second go on the basis that the Otago physics were not as um, difficult as the Auckland physics. Uh, but they, but they it didn't um, didn't have any significant change. So I came back to Auckland, started in the law school, with the acid really on me to succeed. Fortunately, I had also realised in those very maturing years of uh, uh, sixty three, sixty four that my real aptitudes lay with language and debate and uh, a career in law was something that seemed uh, a much better end result of my university studies. So I then went into the law school and I had the benefit of the Dean saying to me, you are now uh, two years older than your, your colleagues because you've had these two years at medical school. We are changing things in legal education and uh, we are making uh, an emphasis on full-time study. But he said to me, and very happily, I think you should complete your degree in the old fashioned way. That is going to lectures in the morning and the early evenings and um, getting a job in a law office as a law clerk. So that's what I did. I uh, went into a, uh, an ordinary solicitor's firm and I did all those things, searching titles, collecting debts, administering estates, rudimentary con uh, conveyancing, uh, learning mm -hmm. skills which never left me later on. And uh, I've always considered it um, uh, a great advantage that I was uh, the recipient of an old fashioned kind of legal training. And then as you've said in your kind introduction, I uh, got through and was admitted to the bar in 1970. By then, I had really decided that I would like to be a courtroom lawyer, and I obtained uh, a position in the Crown Solicitor's Office, and I cut my teeth on prosecuting for the Health Department and the Fisheries Department and the Customs Department, eventually moving on to uh, to criminal trials and undertaking appeals, but it was a great, um, a great schooling ground for one who was uh, fashioning uh, themselves into being a barrister. Mm. And then you moved on to become a judge and an ombudsman after that? Yeah. Um, great fortune. You know, I hadn't planned uh, necessarily on being a judge. But at the end of the 1970s, people may remember that there was a Royal Commission on the courts headed by Sir David Beatty, which changed the uh, court system around. The former magistrate's court became the district court. 
and the Supreme Court became the High Court, and the District Court's jurisdiction was enlarged to include uh, the conduct of jury trials. So all of a sudden, the system started to look for younger, seasoned practitioners who were used to conducting cases um, in the courts uh, as judges. So in 1982, although I was um, relatively young, I think 37, I wasn't the youngest uh, judge ever appointed uh, to the court, but I was among the youngest. Um, and there were there was a significant number of people appointed to the court in that time. And so I then had 12 years working as a judge, uh, specialising in the criminal law. My specialist warrant was uh, the conduct of jury trials. But I also had uh, a general jurisdiction warrant as well. And that led to an interest in um, criminal justice, uh, parole, and therefore uh, that's why I was um, uh, interested in becoming a prison board chairman and a member of the parole board. I also was interested in continuing legal education, which was uh, uh, something I took up later on uh, doing other things. Well, uh, did you maybe well, cover the ombudsman and that? Yeah, answer? I'm sorry, I spoke at some length. Okay. Tell us about that. That also was um, an unplanned matter. I had been working as a district court judge for 12 years. Uh, I enjoyed, uh, we'd, uh, uh, I'd had uh, some time in Palmerston North, South Auckland, uh, West Auckland and Auckland Central. I'd gone to Auckland Central because I needed uh, time to be able to do parole board. Uh, and the judicial education work and be subbed by somebody else. Um, and I was, uh, I was a happy, uh, I was uh, professionally happy with, uh, with my role when all of a sudden I had a, um, a call from the then Minister of Justice, uh, the Honourable Doug Graham, who I'd known at law school. And he said, um, what would you say to uh, putting your name forward to being an ombudsman? And I told him truthfully that that was of interest because I'd had a connection with Sir Guy Poles, New Zealand's first ombudsman, had taken on the role in the 1960s. And Poles was a, was a wonderful man who took an interest in the progression of younger lawyers. And when I went to, uh, to Wellington to do cases uh, in the 1970s, he would, um, he would write to me and say, I'd like you to come and we could have lunch together and I'll talk, we'll talk about um, events of the day and uh, your future in the law. And I learned a great deal from his wise counsel. So when the call came uh, to be an ombudsman, it needed, as you can imagine, deep and intense conversations with Susan because we had... Uh, young children, but we decided in favour of doing it. And we shifted to Wellington and because uh, you simply, it was simply more than preferable uh, to do the job based in the main centre, even though I kept going back uh, to Auckland to do uh, local government based work. So we shifted to Wellington in 1996, uh, we'd had a, a year of me commuting 
And the, as you've said in the intro, I did uh, two five-year terms, um, approximately half of which was while uh, the national government was in power, and approximately half of which was when Labour got into power after the 1999 election. So I had exposure to the upper levels of the public service and the um, senior government officials of the day, as well as ministers and as well uh, members of parliament, because um, although ombudsmen deal with maladministration with complaints about fairness of the actions of government departments, a lot of its work, as people will know uh, from reading the media, a lot of the work of the ombudsman is to do with release of official information. And so that brought me into contact with uh, uh, a number of the public uh, officials to whom I've made reference. And that probably had um, a little bit to do with um, Prime Minister Helen Clark um, asking me to uh, become Governor-General in 2006. That too, I can tell you, was something out of the blue and a complete surprise. Do you want to just tell us a bit more about that process, about how one becomes a Governor-General? Yes, the, um, the conventional process in New Zealand is for the government of the day to make a choice of a particular person who they would like to see serve a five-year term as Governor-General. Uh, the New Zealand law provides for one term of five years per person. And conventionally, when the Prime Minister has a unanimous um, cabinet declaration in favour of one person, the Prime Minister then gets hold of the person and asks them, would they be prepared to uh, undertake uh, service for five years? And uh, if that is agreed to, the New Zealand way of doing things is for the Prime Minister to confer with the Leader of the Opposition because there is the theoretical possibility that during the term of each Governor-General there will be a general election and the government might change. So. Um, the opposition has given uh, some notice of the person they might be working with. And in my case, that proved to be um, appropriate because um, in I was appointed in 2006 and uh, in the 2008 election, uh, National succeeded uh, to office and uh, I spent from 2008 till 2011 uh, with John Key as, as the Prime Minister. So I had the privilege of working with, um, uh, with two Prime Ministers. Uh, and uh, although they were quite different in their style, uh, Helen Clark was um, uh, studious and uh, very thorough and um, uh, studied in uh, the way in which she went about things. John Key was uh, a man who had uh, an extraordinary enthusiasm and who backed himself uh, for the way in which he, he did things. And they, but they were both uh, uh, interesting and enjoyable uh, to work for uh, and to work with.
What can you tell us a bit more about the relationship between the Governor General and the Prime Minister? Do you meet the Prime Minister often? How does that work? Yes. It, in New Zealand, a lot of things are done in a less formal way than they are in, say, the United Kingdom. Uh, in the United Kingdom, the Prime Minister goes and visits the Queen on a regular basis and uh, reports to the Queen about uh, what the government is doing and uh, seeking uh, the Queen's uh, advice, uh, if that is suitable. And uh, that is done in a very formal way with with the venue being uh, Buckingham Palace, or maybe Windsor or Sandringham, etc. In New Zealand, uh, it is much less formal. The uh, my own association with both prime ministers, Helen Clark and John Key, uh, it was. Um, frequent, but not religiously every Sunday or at a particular time of, uh, of the day, we would uh, communicate by telephone and text as well as personally. Governor General goes to Parliament in New Zealand every Monday afternoon for a meeting of the Executive Council which is the body that uh, passes regulations or appoints people to offices, judges, diplomats, etc. And those documents are presented to uh, the Governor General for signature at that time. The fact of the Governor General attending at Parliament and being on tap and being in a particular room at government house, at, at um, the Beehive between four and uh, five each um, each Monday is a good opportunity for the Prime Minister or other ministers uh, to see the Governor General should they wish. What about? What about the Queen's involvement and what was your relationship with the Queen? How did you interact with her? All right, well, the Queen is, of course, the head of state of New Zealand and the Governor General is a New Zealander appointed by the government uh, to act on behalf of the Queen. So before appointment, the practice generally is for the intended person to travel to London and to meet the Queen so that there is at least a tacit approval to the notion that the person chosen as Governor General uh, is her representative. And that happened with, with myself. Susan and I went to Buckingham Palace we had a pleasant luncheon occasion with the Queen, at which, and I see this is part of another question that you have, you know, what is the Queen's uh, interest in New Zealand and its uh, way of life and politics? I can say that I am another person who admires the Queen for the, the intensity of her liking for New Zealand, her familiarity with the country, her recall of uh, places and people that she uh, has uh, connected with whilst here, uh, which was, uh, I thought, remarkable. In the course of the five-year term, there were then three or four other occasions where an opportunity came uh, to meet her. For example, the um, 
uh, the marriage of uh, Prince William. Uh, for example, the opening of a, um, a large war memorial uh, edifice at Tynecott in northern France when uh, a number of governors general were invited uh, because of the uh, large number of graves of uh, Commonwealth soldiers that were there and an opportunity uh, would be taken at an event like that uh, for the Queen to meet and to have a discussion, sometimes uh, uh, something a little bit more than that, a meal perhaps, uh, with, uh, the, uh, with the individual Governors General. So in all, in the course of the whole time, uh, I met Her Majesty on five occasions. Um, that's fantastic. Can you tell us a bit about um, life at Government House and um, you know, what was that like staying there? And also, um, you must have hosted a lot of people at Government House. Yes. Well, it's, the Government House is a, is a busy operation and uh, people in the listening audience will remember that in the time that uh, Susan and I were there, 2006 till 2011. Government House was uh, quite uh, markedly reconstructed. When we entered in 2006, uh, it was clear that um, a lot of the plumbing and electric fitting and uh, tiles on the roof etc. were in great need of uh, upgrade and a decision was made uh, for the building to be strengthened and reconstructed and to have the installation of things like Wi-Fi and we were out of out of there for two and a half of the five years. So in that time we, we had a period at Government House not more than two and a half years. We used the um, uh, Auckland Government House in Epsom um, a, a great deal, probably stayed there uh, quite a long time. We also used um, Vogel House at Lower Hutt and uh, then we had uh, the opportunity to travel uh, within the country a great deal. So we did uh, things like investigators, Queen's Birthday and New Year Honours at places like the RNZAF Museum at Wigram or the Larnock Castle in Dunedin as opposed to, to a government house. Uh, but to come back to your question, um, the two government houses, the two main government houses were quite different. The government house in Wellington is a large 53 room uh, public house, if you like, with large reception rooms, ballrooms, dining rooms, etc. The Governor General and spouse live in a, an apartment upstairs and they come out of their apartment down into the public parts of the building uh, to do their work. So it's an unusual, unusual setting. But on the other hand, it's, um, it's a warm hearted house because uh, the staff at Government House are traditionally very good at their work and uh, they're very well disposed towards the Governor General of the day and spouse. And so uh, 
many things are done to make it an interesting and enjoyable experience. The Auckland Government House is much more like a, um, a private home, a large private home, at the back of which they have built a pavilion. And in the pavilion, uh, they do um, investitures and uh, of people who have gained medals or distinctions uh, and uh, uh, credentials are received from um, diplomats who are starting off their role representing their countries in New Zealand. Um, and you must have hosted uh, a lot of functions there. And I, I seem to recall, did, did Prince William and Kate stay at Government House in Wellington with you when you were there? Yes. Yes, they came uh, a couple of times. Uh, once on a uh, just a general visit, but the other was uh, following the Christchurch earthquake. Um, and uh, they were particular highlights. Uh, members of the royal family uh, coming. Prince Harry came as well. Princess Anne uh, came at least twice. She was a very uh, interesting and uh, warm-hearted and hard-working person. And um, with Prince William, we were uh, a highlight that I can remember. We had him in Auckland, and uh, it was um, um, a time where it all seemed to work for him to be, uh, to have a social occasion, which was provided in the form of a hangi uh, created by the, put, well, put, done by the Hawke family from, from Ngāti Whātua. And uh, the, uh, the television program Brotown was popular at that time with Oscar Kitely and uh, others, members of his uh, of his cast all came and had this uh, wonderful uh, occasion at the Auckland Government House uh, with hangi, hangi cooked food and uh, a very uh, pleasant occasion. Do you have any other highlight you want to mention from your time as uh, Governor General? Yes, I, 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 you, you had, you kindly sent me a draft of your questions, and this was, this was a, a, a difficult one because, without doing an injustice to, to anyone, uh, we did have the privilege of a, a great many encounters with, with people, but. Even having said that, there are two or three occasions that do come to mind. Uh, the, the VC award to Corporal Willie Appiata um, was a very special and super formal occasion. There were some very charming visitors from overseas, the uh, Chilean uh, President Madame Bachelet, who is now a significant person uh, in the United Nations Human Rights, the President of Finland, President Harlanen, and the King of Tonga, uh, with whom, uh, in a personal way, uh, I got on. I got on very well. So. Those are people who come to mind. I've just got something to show you, if you just bear with him. Uh, um, while we're waiting, just remember, if you want to ask some questions, just chuck them into the chat. And we'll, Here is a, a, large, a large book, a folio. I've got about four or five of them. 
the the ADA comps, the Governor General's aides, have the duty of uh, examining articles in the press where the Governor General has been involved, and they collect them and and bind them and give them to uh, to the Governor General at the end. When I was preparing for our encounter this morning, uh, at Susan's uh, request, I went and got out the uh, the book, which I don't do every very often. But it was um, it makes the point that there are so many things to uh, to look back on and enjoy again. But I think I've given uh, a reasonable flavour by mentioning those few people. Yes, Lady Sue brought one of those books to a community event that we had out in Linden. All oh, right, okay. And I was just amazed at how many different um, dignitaries from around the world were hosted at um, Government House. Yeah, um, it's something like the Governor General has, and I think this is the correct figure, something like 400 occasions to address each year. Um, you know, big ones, small ones, but often needing the preparation and delivery of a speech or doing something in connection with them. It's, it's well managed, but uh, it is constant and busy. Mm, must, must have been. Uh, we've got a few moments left. My last question on the list was um, post Governor General, what what did you do after being Governor General? Well, funnily enough, I one of the main things I did uh, involved um, an ongoing connection with the Queen because I'd had a role uh, rolling back the rolling back the events whilst I was an ombudsman. I was identified as a working ombudsman from a much smaller jurisdiction than the United States or Australia or Canada. And I was invited to go to London once a year and on some occasions more than once a year to help deliver a Commonwealth funded training program uh, for, for newly appointed ombudsmen in Commonwealth countries. So I'd go to London uh, and uh, help two professors uh, deliver, deliver the program, uh, which was a, a lovely experience of, of itself. But um, that led me to have a connection with Marlborough House, uh, the head of, uh, uh, that's where the Commonwealth Secretariat is. And um, uh, I had uh, a connection there with uh, Sir Don McKinnon, who was um, Secretary General. And uh, it was with his advice and help that my name was put forward to become chair of the Commonwealth Foundation, which is the civil society counterpart of the Commonwealth Secretariat. So when there is a chogum, like there is at the moment in Kigali, Rwanda, there is also being held a meeting of civil society from all over the Commonwealth. And uh, that's what the Commonwealth Foundation was uh, was connected with and I had two two-year terms and that was hugely enjoyable um, and interesting uh, and uh, I also keeping up the international flavour I'd had a connection in New Zealand after finishing office as Governor General with Transparency International the anti-corruption body and I still have that connection although it's now 
an, an advisory position on the International Anti-Corruption Council. So uh, that means um, in practical terms about once every five or six weeks, New Zealand is always the kind of tail end Charlie when it's early, early morning in Toronto and uh, uh, New York. It's uh, lunchtime in London and Germany. And it's, yes, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 a.m. in New Zealand. So I, I still take part in those, um, in those things. I'm presently uh, at home here, Chancellor of the University of Waikato. And I have um, patronage of a small number of community organisations. Susan and I both have... Um, community interests, as, you, as you'll be aware. Mm. So still keeping very, very busy, sounds like. It's not as busy as I used to be, but uh, yeah, still pretty busy. Excellent. Well, that's fantastic. Um, now, if there's any, there's no questions in the chat, maybe I've asked all the questions that were, uh, that people wanted to ask. If you've got any, just chuck them in there. But um, that was a great uh, insight into the life of a governor general. I've certainly learned a lot and into uh, your life, of course. Um, there's still no questions in there. That's okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hand over to Kirsten. If I can find her on here. She, and Kirsten's our social connection coordinator for Wellington and Porirua. And she's just going to say a few words. We, there you are, Kirsten. Well, thank you so much, Sir Anand. That was uh, really enlightening. Um, yeah, you've had a very long and illustrious career. The highlights for me, I think, would have been the marriage of Prince William and Catherine. That would have been pretty amazing going to that. Um, and also, you mentioned going to Larnack Castle for the investiture. That would have been pretty cool too. Um, yeah, so uh, we're really thankful that you've spent almost an hour with us this afternoon talking about your career. It's been, yeah, like I said, enlightening and interesting. So thanks so much. It's been a delight. Um, I think your organization and the work that it does is, um, is, a great, is of great benefit uh, to a large number of people. And it's a pleasure to uh, assist its uh, its advancement in whatever little way is possible. We were very lucky to um, have our volunteers uh, come and spend some time in your house last uh, December. You've got a pretty amazing house there as well. So thanks for letting us come and crash at your place. It was great. Well, thank you, Anand. Again, we really appreciate your time this afternoon. Uh, it's been fantastic. And just want to say thanks to everyone else who's uh, joined us as well. Hope you enjoyed this afternoon. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks at our next Curious Conversations. So enjoy the rest of your Monday. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everyone. See you later.